Hi YouTube, this is one of a series of videos looking at the documentary A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Moon, produced by Bart Sabrell. You will hear me mention him quite a lot. Check out my channel for other videos in the series, or for the box set where you can watch them all in one feature length video. Part 2, the early US space program. In this section, Sibrel attempts to characterise the early US space program and sets up the hoax. First, I'll identify the claims made in the movie and then address them one by one. When the Soviet Union launched mankind's first satellite, Sputnik, in 1957, there was grave concern that they had mastered space ahead of the United States and might use this advantage to launch a first nuclear strike from an orbit high above North America. Concern turned to fear and then horror as America watched their communist enemy achieve all these firsts with no hope in sight of ever catching up. If it was impossible to better the Soviets in the space race, which was really a race of technological armaments, what could be done? How could America offset the threat of superior weaponry? Throughout the history of rivalry and war, astute generals of lesser armies than their counterparts have used deceit and misinformation as a method to achieve victory. In keeping a secret of the magnitude of the Apollo missions being fraudulently created, one turns to the Manhattan Project for comparison. Surreptitiously building the first nuclear bomb during the early to mid-1940s involved 129,500 people over a three-year period. Yet the secret did not get out. A quarter... The USA kicked off the space race on July 29, 1955, when they announced plans for an Earth-orbiting satellite to be launched for the International Geophysical Year in 1958. The Soviets responded four days later when they announced plans for a similar satellite to be launched in the near future. Although it's true that the Soviets took an early lead following Sputnik in October 1957 with an impressive list of firsts, their failures were not made public like those of the United States, such as the very public failure of the Project Vanguard launch. Despite this, there is no reason to believe that the USA had no way to catch up with Soviet space development. The USA had the expertise in the form of more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers and technicians who were recruited from Germany at the end of World War II and had a proven track record in rocket engineering, along with skilled scientists and engineers from the USA and other countries. Existing research and engineering from the Army Ballistic Missile Agency and the United States Naval Research Laboratory and the organisational advantage of tying all these resources into a single civilian agency with the formation of NASA in 1958. They also had the vast resources and budget of a superpower nation and the political desire to correct the space technology gap. Sibrel offers no reason at all for this no hope claim or for a subsequent claim that it would be impossible for the USA to catch the Soviets. How could this possibly be true of a nation so well resourced for the task? Ultimately, the Soviet lead was fairly short-lived. This chart shows how the USA, represented here by the Blue Line, soon surpassed Soviet space experience in 1965 as the Gemini program progressed. The threat of superior weaponry clearly is offset by developing similar superior weaponry and not by achieving a lunar landing even though there are some obvious crossovers in the technologies. The Soviets have never achieved even a manned lunar orbit, and yet have maintained an effective intercontinental ballistic missile deterrent to the present day. Some politicians at the time, such as Senator Barry Goldwater and Senator William Proxmire, argued that the civilian space program was pushing the more important military one aside. When President Kennedy met with Soviet Premier Khrushchev in 1961, he suggested a joint landing with the Soviets and repeated this offer in a speech at the United Nations in September 1963. If a lunar landing was the only way to get ahead of the Soviets, why would Kennedy twice ask them to share the mission? The Manhattan Project would be a good candidate for the worst kept secret in history. Convicted Soviet spies who infiltrated the project and passed many secrets to the Soviet Union included Klaus Fuchs, Harry Gold, David Greenglass, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, George Koval and Theodore Hall. Next, Sabrell proposes potential cost savings of hoaxing the mission. 
and suggests how the hoax could have been achieved. Again, I will highlight a list of claims first and then address them one by one. The cost of the program, whose sole goal was to be the first to plant a flag on the lifeless rock just outside the Earth, if adjusted for inflation to the 21st century, was $135 billion. With a profit margin of just 7%, this would be equal to over $9 billion profit going to the privileged contractors chosen by their friends at NASA. If the machinery was in fact only achieving Earth orbit, as other earlier missions had already done, then the completion and functionality of the other components would not have been as important, and even more profit would have been made. Just one year before the first mission to the moon, NASA launched the Tetra satellite, specifically designed to simulate flight data coming from the moon, so that the ground crews could rehearse the landing, much as the astronauts did in their own simulations. Had it not supposedly fallen back to Earth, all that would have been needed during the actual flight would be a repeat of one of these computer programs, with a few original variations, transmitted to the satellite for rebroadcast to Houston. Scores of computers and their deceived operators on the ground would then receive prearranged information, including the alleged location, altitude and fuel consumption of the spacecraft, as if it were descending to the moon's surface. If the Soviets tried to find the actual location of an Apollo crew in the hundreds of thousands of miles surrounding the Earth and the Moon, it would be tantamount to trying to find a rowboat in the Atlantic Ocean. The fact that the Apollo program was so departmentalized, with various construction and test sites around the country, meant that only a few people saw the whole picture. And for the first time ever, there was no independent press coverage of such an historical event. Whatever pictures and sound were distributed to the public were strictly controlled and previewed by the federal government. They were then disseminated unchecked until this hour. For who would realize that the unthinkable was not only possible, but absolutely true? It would take a long time to really examine the mathematics here, but we can see some obvious blunders. Sabrell has taken the entire Apollo budget and assigned it all to contractors, when of course large amounts were spent on construction and equipping of facilities, most of which are still in use as government buildings today, and on the wages of employees working directly for NASA. Whilst it's true to say that a large proportion of the budget did go to contractors, the idea that this was just a collection of backhanded deals is absurd. There were over 500 main contractors and subcontractors in a wide array of industries. For money to be saved, the contractors who build the spacecraft and their engineers, along with hundreds of NASA engineers and quality assurance personnel, would have to know not to build a spacecraft capable of going to the moon, but instead to build a cheap stage prop or build nothing at all. This means bringing many hundreds of people in on the hoax. Even junior engineers working on such a project would be aware that what they were producing was not fit for purpose. The alternative to this is to not tell the contractors about the hoax and have them and their engineers build a spacecraft capable of a lunar landing. But this negates any cost saving and negates the reason for a hoax. Tetra A was a very small satellite fitted with an S-band transponder launched to provide training to the manned spaceflight network allowing them to develop and verify target acquisition and handover techniques using the S-band system. NASA launched a number of similar satellites in the late 60s and early 70s. The manned spaceflight network was a series of receiving stations around the world on land, ships and aircraft which received signals from space and relayed them via radio transmission and landlines to the Mission Control Center. So it is true to say that NASA mission controllers were just receiving data via landlines and would have no idea of its origin. Consequently, a satellite was not required to train them and would not be required to fool them either. The manned spaceflight network is a very different matter. The operators here absolutely can't be fooled by a satellite. Their antennas must be precisely aimed. As seen from Earth, an Apollo spacecraft on a translunar trajectory 
would always be in roughly the same direction as the Moon. But Tetra A was orbiting the Earth once every 92 minutes, so from a point on Earth it would appear to streak quickly across the sky. The manned spaceflight network operators took great pride in being able to use the Doppler shift of the radio signals to determine the flight path of the Apollo spacecraft. When compared later with flight records, they even observed motion of the spacecraft due to such subtle effects as waste dumps and sublimator operation. So Tetra A would not be required to fool the mission controllers and would have no chance of fooling the manned spaceflight network operators. The Apollo spacecraft were tracked optically from Earth all the way to the Moon and back by hundreds of amateur and professional astronomers. There are hundreds of recorded observations of the missions from all around the world, including live TV broadcasts of the spacecraft in flight. A few amateurs were able to receive radio transmissions from the spacecraft in flight and even from the astronauts on the surface of the Moon. This Russian website gives an account from E. Molotov, a Soviet technician who was tasked with testing Soviet communications for their planned lunar program using transmissions from the Apollo craft. Using a 30 metre dish in the Crimea, his team were able to receive voice telemetry and TV transmissions from the spacecraft. This is another mischaracterization. NASA published highly detailed descriptions of the engineering and detailed mission plans. The independent press scrutinized and reported on all of this, along with construction and testing of the engineering and training of the astronauts. The missions themselves were covered by hundreds of reporters at Mission Control, who could hear astronaut transmissions from the spacecraft broadcast live over loudspeakers, along with regular NASA public affairs updates on the progress and status of the astronauts and spacecraft. This is not strict government control by anybody's standard. We are now about halfway through the film, and so far Sabrell has provided us with his fundamental misunderstanding of physics, along with totally unfounded and illogical reasoning to support his hoax idea. In part three, he offers supposed evidence of this hoax, with an analysis of Apollo photography. Thanks for watching. Please rate, comment, and subscribe.